And if you're telling me, oh, I'm an introvert and I really don't like people looking at me, I don't want to, you know what, that's not the same thing. What I'm talking about here is being present in who you are, owning who you are, accepting who you are, and allowing that presence to come forward, being your best authentic self. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your Daily Helping. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Daily Helping Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and I can only describe our guest today as awesome. Her name is Liz Bruner, and she is a best-selling author, executive communications coach, lauded speaker, podcast host, and Emmy Award-winning journalist. Recognized as one of the nation's most accomplished journalists, Liz conducted exclusive one-on-one interviews with prominent figures over a 28-year career, ranging from professional athletes to global political leaders, including President Barack Obama. In 2013, Liz excitedly embarked upon her next chapter, becoming the CEO and founder of Bruner Communications and launched BrunerAcademy.com. Both are dedicated to helping people find their authentic voice, tell their story, and lead with presence. This is a frequent speaker at corporate conventions and universities, as well as the host of the Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner podcast, where her guests share inspirational stories of recreation, redemption, and transformation. A lot of pressure here now. We've built it up. Liz, welcome to The Daily Helping. It is awesome to have you here. Well, first of all, thank you. And and who are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) No, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Richard. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Great to be here today. I'm excited to have you. We're going to have a great conversation. There's so many different things where we can go because you're doing some very different and important things than you did earlier in your career. But I, I love to hop in the time machine and go back. And I'd love for you to share with us what puts you on the journey you're on today. So many things. Where do I even begin? I consider myself being in almost my fourth next career chapter. I graduated Lawrence University's Conservatory of Music and was a high school music teacher for a number of years. And I really enjoyed it and was also singing semi-professionally with a chorale that toured Europe. And we were in Austria, Germany, Switzerland. Uh, We even performed in Italy for Pope John Paul II in Vatican Square. So I was really enjoying that time in my life. And as a teacher, I was enjoying really inspiring young students to find the love of music and how to share those stories through song. But I also felt like there was something more I was supposed to do. And I I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know what it was, but I, I knew there was something more I was supposed to do. So I left television, not knowing what I would do, worked in retail for a couple of years. You know, somebody has to pay the bills. And I had done one television commercial when I was Miss Illinois 1979 in the Miss America Scholarship Pageant. And thank you very much. That scholarship pageant paid for all of my education. I paid for every penny of it. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if I could do something in television. Like you, I actually thought about going into psychology. And I thought about becoming an architect. I thought about becoming an interior designer. But there was something about television that intrigued me. I bravely and blindly called up two television stations in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which was where I was living at the time and went on something called an informational interview. I'd never heard of such a thing, but I was reading a book by Dr. Richard Lathrop that is titled, Who's Hiring Who? He talked about informational interviews, so I bravely and blindly called up these two stations. What does somebody like me do when you think you want to get into television? Do I need to go back to school, get another degree? Does what I think I want to do even exist? I thought maybe public relations After about six months of conversation, 
a position was literally created for me at the CBS affiliate. And I learned everything on the, from the ground up. It was my graduate school. And anything they said, Liz, we want you to do this. Liz, we want you to do that. Liz, we want you to have your own show. Liz, we want you to do the weather. I'd say, sure, no problem. I'd go home and freak out. <laughs> what am I doing? But I always believed that just because you've never done something doesn't mean you can't. You just have to try. So I got into television. I was at that station for three years. I got called to another CBS station which was in Tampa, Florida, and I was there for five years. And I went down as the director of community relations. And I was the only female in upper management. Talk about pushing through that glass ceiling. Woo-hoo, that was tough. <laughs> and then within a very short period of time, they asked me to be the morning news anchor. So I wore two hats, mm. meaning I was doing my manager's job and I was the early morning news anchor. I got up at three o'clock in the morning. I was at the station at four. I think we were on the air at five. And then by 930 after the news meeting, I'd go up and put my other hat on to my office upstairs. And I was there for five years and did that. And then I got called to WCVB in Boston. And WCVB is the ABC station in Boston. And it's very renowned, award-winning station. And I was offered the opportunity to be a correspondent for the news magazine show Chronicle. And it was just so much fun. And so I came to Boston and again, within a year, <laughs> I was tapped to be the morning news anchor. And so again, I'm wearing two hats. And after about five years of wearing two hats and working 80 hours a week, I said, I can't, I can't do both anymore. And so I ended up staying in the news department and very fortunate to have had an amazing career, an award-winning career, interviewing, you mentioned President Barack Obama and Oprah and many at professional athletes covering major, major stories, 9-11, the Boston Marathon. And then a couple of years before I actually did leave, so around 2011, I thought, hmm, and there was that little feeling again, Dr. Richard, of, hmm, I think, what else might I do? And so I launched my business in 2013, and I haven't looked back, and I can't even believe that I'm coming up in October of 2022, and it's going to be nine years. How the heck did that happen? Especially when I never, ever wanted to own my own business in the first place. So that's a very short Reader's Digest kind of thumb, sort of what, what do I say, a timeline through uh, my right. history there. <laughs> I, I know it's kind of surreal to do this as your life and, and do that in the span of a couple of minutes. But um, And here you are, and you've got your business today, and we're going to talk about your book. I want to talk about all those things. I, I am curious, as you were privileged to interview some really remarkable people, what were some of the big lessons you learned from these interviews? What surprises people most, Dr. Richard, is that while, yes, I interviewed the president, and I'm honored because interviewing a sitting president, you know, no matter your politics, is a pretty big deal. And I interviewed a lot of celebrities, but my favorite stories were always the ones that dealt with transformation and people who had risen above tough times, the medical miracle stories, you know, a face transplant, a double hand transplant, where people's lives were literally transformed and they found a way to be resilient. They found a way to rise above. Those were always my favorite stories. You know, it's, it's interesting because like you, and we we talked about this a bit off air, we've had some kind of similar guests on our show. And it's great to have the luminaries of a profession, but it's some of these stories with people that maybe nobody's heard of or not and as many people are heard of who have overcome remarkable things because it's, it's relatable and it shows all of us that we can do really anything we put our minds to. I'll liken it to 9-11. And I ended up being the reporter that covered the victims' families, one of the reporters who covered the victims' families. But my role ended up being really working with them. And it started with the day of 9-11. My videographer and I were headed off to go to some polling voting story. And we learned of the crash into the World Trade Center. And they said, we need you to go to this home in Needham. We think that the husband might have been on that plane. And so we pulled up and I see this woman sitting on a front porch. She's tears streaming down her, 
her face. She's got tissues in her hand and she looks to be about seven months pregnant. And I told my videographer, I said, stay here. Let me go and talk to her. And as I approached her, she said, do you know anything? Do you know anything? And I said, I don't know much. And, and it was just heartbreaking. And so I, I couldn't even interview her that day. But then at the six month mark, we brought a group together who had lost a loved one. And the emotion, Dr. Richard, in that room was palpable. And they were moving their wedding rings up and down their fingers, unsure whether to leave them on or take them off. They were holding photographs of their loved ones with tears streaming down their face. I met them at six months. I met them at one year. I met them at two years, three years, five years. And then the 10-year anniversary, I invited them to my home. And to see the transformation, it was a privilege and an honor to be able to share their stories and get to know them. And that's the kind of storytelling that was so special and so important. Amazing. It, as you tracked those people over time, was there any common thread between them about what was able to help them move past 9-11? A lot of it came from support of family and friends and knowing they weren't the only one because so many people had lost lives and they had kind of almost formed their own little family, if you will, because they all had lost someone. And I also was privileged to be one of the few reporters around the country who went to a camp where children who had lost a father or a mother in 9-11 were there and to be with those young people and to watch them grow and to see the healing that took place, not only at the camp, but the years that, that passed after that, it really was love. It was love. It was support. It was compassion. Every single thing, that was the thread throughout all of those things. And, and I know that that thread, compassion and improvement transformation. That's just so central to you and what you're doing. Before we kind of jump into that, I am curious. So you were an award-winning journalist, won your Emmy, and you're doing incredible things there. Why walk away? Did, did you just know it was time? <laughs> like what was, what was the impetus for making that such a radical change? Well, two years before I left, as I was touched on a moment ago, I was thinking, you know what? The industry is changing dramatically. Just even the length of the stories, because I was doing so many of the big exclusive stories, which took a lot of time. And they're trying to tell me, well, you can't have even three and a half minutes for the story. You have to do it in a minute and a half. I'm like, I'm not doing the president in a minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of things were changing. And I'm not going to say that it was a, a sexist thing, but the men were continuing to get older and the women were continuing to get younger. Okay. And I thought, okay, you know, I still have enough energy. What else might I do? And so for those two years, Dr. Richard, I was quietly and confidentially talking to people in the community whom I admired and respected. What does somebody like me do when you're thinking, well, maybe I could do something else? What might that be? I had no clue. Again, I had no clue. And I would say, what do you see as my skill set? It was so interesting because some people would say, well, I see you read the news every night. Trust me, it's more than just reading the news every night. But then I had to learn how to translate my skill set into language they understood. For example, in the corporate world, crisis management could be breaking news in television. Being a reporter producer of a story in television is almost like a project manager in the corporate world. So once I'd be able to kind of explain that and, and share with them what my skill set was, suddenly kind of dots began to get connected and things made sense. And so people would point me in other directions and then I would have a conversation with one person and I'd say, okay, who else should I be talking to? And will you connect me more importantly? I finally narrowed it down to three lanes. One was, okay, I could be some communications expert for a corporation. I don't know who, but that's one lane. Another lane could be getting involved with more charity work because I've always been involved with nonprofit organizations. Maybe I could be an executive director or maybe I could start my business and I could help people with presence, public speaking, storytelling, presentation skills, media training, leadership, everything in between. And here's what my mentor said to me, one of my mentors, Liz, you're well-known, you're well-respected, you have credibility. 
that is value. Why would you give that value to somebody else? Launch your business. If in six months or nine months, you don't like it, you don't have any clients, you can always go do something else. Dr. Richard, a kaleidoscope went click and everything made sense. And I suddenly said, okay, I'm going to do it. I never ever wanted to own my own business. Never thought I would own my own business. Thought I was not smart enough to own my own business. But I did it literally six weeks after that conversation. That's why I did it. I did it. And I'm so glad I did. I wonder why I didn't do it sooner now. <laughs> and so here we are, right? You, you've been doing this and, and at a very, very high level. So talk to us. You know, you, you, one of the things I know you help in individuals and corporations do find their voice, find their presence. Talk to us about why that matters and then I've got another follow-up question, but I'm going to be the good journalistic type person and only ask one question. So let's start there. Okay. I'm on my best behavior with you because I know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether I should be happy about that or not. Okay. <laughs> I should be, be happy. All right. When it comes to presence, I personally believe that every single one of us wants to have presence or more of it. Every single one of us wants to feel that we're valued that we're seen, that we're heard, that we matter. None of us wants to be ignored. And if you're telling me, oh, I'm an introvert and I really don't like people looking at me, I don't want to be, you know what? That's not the same thing. What I'm talking about here is being present in who you are, owning who you are, accepting who you are, and allowing that presence to come forward, being your best authentic self. And I think that's why it matters because we all want to be seen and heard and that we matter and that we're valuable. So that's the presence piece. What was the second part of your question? <laughs> so my question is, you, you started this business in 2013 and you came in really at the tipping point with respect to social media. You know, Facebook had been several years from its transition out of just college-only students to being everywhere. So as a medium, though social media had been around, by 2010-ish, it was out of control because we had iPhones as well. So how has that alt presence, the ability to you know, define who you are and show the world what you do, how have you seen that shift within the last 10 years? I believe that just as corporations are a brand, people are a brand too. And there's nothing wrong with that. We have to take advantage of every opportunity in a healthy way to promote the work that we do, to promote who we are. And I liken it to, you can't think, oh, if I just do a good job at my job, somebody's going to notice me and I'm going to get promoted. It's not how it works. And I think there's a, you have to find the right healthy balance of self-promotion. Now, do I think everybody who's on social media has a healthy brand? No, <laughs> but it is a tool that can be used well. And when it is, it can help you have a brand if you know what your brand is. And that's another important component that I work with people on is figuring out what is your brand? Who do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known for? Why do you want to be known for X, Y, or Z? So social media, and, and I felt like I was kind of late to the game. I, you know, I was like, what? what's this social media thing? I'll be honest. I was like, okay. And one of my girlfriends said to me, you've got to be on Facebook. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, and so I did. And I, I mean, I still feel like I'm playing catch up with the social media world. Yes, I'm on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Facebook. Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Yes, I'm on Instagram. Please find me. Please follow me, <laughs> anyone who's listening. And, but now I do think it's so important. And I'm really glad that I'm on it because I'm able to share, just as you are, some of the message of how we want to make a difference in the world. And when I can do some of that through social media, powerful tool, powerful tool. You know, it's interesting, Liz, you had mentioned part of your decision making for exiting television and the news was this reducing story time to 
a minute and a half when it used to be three. And you know, one of the things that we know from from research, neuroscience research, is our attention span is yes, it's going down like crazy. I don't think those two are, are accidental. Those are, are to me highly correlated things, right? We are, you know, a flash flash of firework in my face. I want I want it now. I want to be dazzled now. And if if something doesn't excite me, it's gone. Yes. Well, and that's why I love working with people on their presentation skills and public speaking skills and storytelling, because the way you have to learn how to communicate, connect, and engage with your audience from the moment you begin. They have to be thinking, wow, I can't wait to hear more from this person. What are they going to say next? It can't be, well, we're going to tell you about this today, and then we're going to tell you about that, and then we're going to do this, and then they tell you, and then they retell you what you t- they told you. That doesn't work today. And you, you're the scientist. You know this. It doesn't work today. Right. I, I'm curious as well. So, you know, you've given us this tantalizing piece of, it's actually more than tantalizing because it's critical, like whatever you do. And I've argued this with people, whether you have a business or you don't, you're a brand, right? Like if you work for somebody else, that's cool. Right. I said, not, you know, nobody here judges people that have a job versus entrepreneurs, but the reality is you're in competition regardless of what space you're in and what better way to differentiate yourself because a resume is just a piece of paper, right? Amidst thousands. Like if you have to get the next job or find the next client, what better way than to have some sort of social proof behind who you are? So I think that's awesome. And I, and I wondered if you would dip into your bag of magic tricks and share just a couple of, I'll give away all the secrets to the Liz Bruner, you know, <laughs> empire, but, but share just a couple, you know, things. If somebody is really thinking about establishing presence, what should they, where should they start? Oh my gosh, that's a loaded question, it is. Dr. Richard. On purpose, it is. on purpose. Be- because first and foremost, everybody comes to the table at a different place on that learning curve with where they are with their presence, where they are with their brand, where they are with their comfort level of all of that. So that's the first phase, I believe, is figuring out where are you with all of that? And what is your definition of presence? What is your definition of having a brand? Who do you think has presence? Why do you think they have presence? Because if you can't name someone who has presence, if you can't define why you think they have presence, what characteristics they have, how can you possibly learn to emulate it? So that, to me, is one of the first places to start is who has presence? What does that mean? What does that look like? Why do you think somebody has presence? I love to ask this question in workshops and even in one-on-one sessions with clients because the, the answers are always very, very interesting. And to see who they think has presence and why they think somebody has presence. What is it about them that has presence? And then to step back and go, okay, do I have any of those qualities? And if I do, can I enhance those qualities? So that to me is just one little tip in the Liz Bruner bag of tricks. That's the first place to start. I love that. I hope that helps people. <laughs> no, I, th- I think that's great. And, and it really lays out that there's a foundational piece before you even jump into what is my brand? What do I, what do I want to project to the world? So thank you for, for sharing that with us. I want to transition a bit and talk about your book. So your book came out in November, sales are doing great, the reviews have been fabulous. What was the impetus for writing your book? I actually started writing it in the summer of 2019. But even before then, Dr. Richard, people were constantly telling me, Liz, you should be writing a book. And this would come from family or friends or clients or workshop participants. And I thought, okay, well, maybe someday I'd write a book. I had no idea what I would write about. And I started reading books on how to write a book. (laughs) And by the time summer of 2019 came along, I thought maybe I'd read enough how to write a book books (laughs) and I could maybe start. And so I started. And I kind of started writing a few chapters but I felt like I was going off course. So I stopped writing. 
and life gets in the way, as it often does. You've talked about wanting to write your book and you're like, can't quite get started on it just yet. So, you know, and the initial title of the book, which was the impetus was a quote from my grandmother, which is no knowledge is ever wasted. No knowledge is ever wasted. And so I put it aside and then I was working with a business coach and I, this was now we're fast forwarding to the summer of 2020 and we're in the middle of the pandemic. And I had thought about launching BrunnerAcademy.com, which is my online learning platform the following summer, but I felt like I've got the time. Now is the time to do it. And a lot of my, my clients kind of disappeared as with everybody, our businesses, we had to pivot because of the pandemic. And I thought I need to find a way to offer some of my services that would be helpful to people in a different way. And that's how it started. So I said to my business coach that, you know, the production came out great, how to be a rock star public speaker course. It's fantastic. I said, I'd like for you to, to look at it. And she said, well, I think I'd like to read it. Can you transcribe? Can you transcribe the course for me? I said, Michelle, I wrote it. I can send you the scripts. <laughs> so I sent it to her and she said, this is really good. She says, you know, I co-own a publishing company. I said, how did I not know that after all this time? So she got back to me and she said, this is a really great course, but it reads like a course. I said, I wrote it as a course. And she said, it would take a lot of work to make it into a book. And I said, well, I happen to have this other stuff. Now, the off course section became the how to be a rock star public speaker. That was the template. I said, I have all this other content. It's not a lot. I don't know if it's any good. May I send it to you and you can let me know. She said, okay. She got back to me and she said, Liz, this is really, really good. This is the beginning of a book. And we have a program where we will provide you with a writing coach. We will provide you with an editor. We will provide the artwork. We will get it all the way to almost the finish line. And you can then take it and shop it and go someplace else, or we can publish it. So it was a year ago, March, April of 2021, when I got connected with Shauna, my writing coach, and I sent her those very early chapters. And she said, I want to know more about this story. I want to know more about that story. I said, you do? Really? Okay. Dr. Richard, I started writing and I, I was almost possessed. I just, the more I wrote, the more I had to say, and the more I had to say, the more I wrote. And by the end of July, I had finished my manuscript. That's the book. Give us the title. The title is Dare to Own You, Taking Your Authenticity and Dreams into Your Next Chapter. And again, it goes back to my grandmother's quote, no knowledge is ever wasted. People say, well, how did you go from being a high school music teacher to, to being in retail, to having this career, to being an entrepreneur? Well, guess what? The themes and the threads that run through that are no knowledge is ever wasted. All every single one of those opportunities, I learned something that I now carry with me into the role that I'm doing now. And if I can make this many transitions and create next chapters, guess what? So can anybody else out there listening. I love this because, and it's so timely, as you know, the great resignation and so many people were fed up of the corporate world they lived in and the hours and everything else. It's more people than ever before are trying to create that next chapter in their life, be something they weren't, own their own business. So the quote by your grandma is awesome too. Take us through the tenets of the book. What is somebody going to get if they work their way through, through reading this book? Well, initially I was calling it a personal and professional memoir with a lot of transformational tools in it. And I still call it that. But Forbes, I'm so grateful to because they reviewed it and recommended it. And, and the Forbes uh, reviewer said, this is a teaching memoir. And I love that teaching memoir because that's exactly what I wanted it to be. Because I take you through accepting and owning who we are. I take you through the power of authenticity and the courage to be confident because it takes courage 
to be confident. It's not something that we get one day and, okay, I'm going to be confident the rest of my life. No, 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 no. It's a barometer. It goes up and down sometimes. There's an ebb and flow, and we have to choose it sometimes. And then how to help people find their voice. And I share a lot of personal stories about my own struggles with imposter syndrome, outsider syndrome. And then how can we carry all of those things to being the leader who we are on the inside? And what does that mean as we move through our world professionally? And there's also a chapter called, is it a wish or is it a dream? And the distinction is a wish is, as I said early on, well, someday I might write a book, but did I put any action behind it initially? No. And that's what it takes in order to turn a wish of, well, someday I might do X and turn it into the reality of the dream coming alive is action and commitment. And when you put that behind it, you come, I mean, that's, that's how you get to that next chapter. And at the end of every chapter are poignant questions and exercises that I offer the reader. I call the sections time to reflect. And I really hope that people will ask themselves those tough questions. They've been questions I've asked of myself that were not easy to answer. But when you do, I believe, and my hope and prayer with this book is that will allow people to own more of who they are, to find their authentic self, to own that authentic self, and then take that and create those dreams, create those next chapters. That is the goal of the book. I love it. I love it. And, and briefly, tell us a little bit about your podcast. I'd love to shine a light on that too. Thank you so much for asking. My vision for my life is to teach, to motivate, to inspire people to live their best life, whatever that is for you. And my podcast started in February of 2020. And my digital producer was always like, Liz, you got to start a podcast. I'm like, it's so much work. <laughs> but I loved interviewing people. So I said, okay. And I knew I had to make the commitment because of my journalism background. I do a lot of homework on everybody. But the show itself is really, again, another opportunity to transform and to hear other people's stories of how they've made those transitions in their life, how they've created next chapters, how they've risen above tough times. And it really is meant to be inspirational. And my guests are amazing. I mean, I'm just so lucky and so fortunate to have had wonderful, wonderful guests. And my hope and prayer is that when somebody, again, hears those stories, they can say, you know what? I can do it too. I can make that shift. I can make that change. I can rise above. I can become resilient. Awesome. I love it. And we'll have the URL to the podcast yes. in the Thank show you. notes. So, so stay Thank tuned for you. that. Liz, this has been so much fun. As you know, I wrap up every episode just by asking one single question. And that is, what is your biggest helping, Liz? That one most important piece of information you'd like the audience to walk away with after hearing us today? I'm going to give you a couple. Number one, if I can make these transitions in my life, anybody can. And number two, discover who you are. Give yourself permission to own who you are. And if you do, it will take you into your next chapters and ensure that you are living your best life. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean that you're going to not have challenges. Life throws us challenges all the time. A quote from my mother, the goal of living is to be able to absorb all of the pain of life and lose none of the joy. That's the takeaway. Well, between your mom and your grandma, you, you have some good genes there in terms of <laughs> profound quotes. Liz Bruner, Awesome. I loved our show. Tell us where people can find out more about you online and learn about your book and your courses and all this good stuff. Oh, thank you for asking. I really appreciate that. Perhaps the easiest place to go is to my website, which is lizbruner.com. That's L-I-Z-B-R-U-N-N-E-R.com. And you'll find out about my book there. You'll find out about bruneracademy.com. You'll find out about my podcast. You'll find out about all the services that we have. So that's great. Or you can just go to bruneracademy.com also, which has my flagship public speaking course and also four new courses that we're calling the DARE Collection, which they're not based on the book, but they align with the book. Dare to go for your goals. Dare to rise above tough times. Dare to shift 
from procrastination to motivation and dare to find peace of mind. Fantastic. And like I said, everything Liz Bruner will have at thedailyhelping.com in her show notes. So if you're at the gym, we got you covered. Liz, loved it. I loved every moment of our time together today. Thank you so much for coming on The Daily Helping and sharing what you are doing in the world with all of us today. Well, and I want to thank you for having me, Dr. Richard, because I love what you're doing in terms of trying to make sure that you have a million acts of kindness out there because every single one of us can do one thing at least one thing a day to change somebody's life. Be well, look, thank you. Absolutely. And you stole my tagline a little bit, but I love that you did it. You do do your homework, no doubt about that. So listen, if you heard our episode today and you like what you heard, give us a five-star review because that helps other people find the show. But as Liz said, and I've said this over 250 times now, go out there today do something nice for somebody else, even if you don't know who they are, and post in your social media feeds using the hashtag MyDailyHelping, because the happiest people are those that help others. <laughs>